Hi, I'm Jenny Brown, Sales Director at Mortgages for Business and welcome to our landlord event, Investing in the New Normal. Thank you so much for joining us today. We really do appreciate you taking the time to come and hear what we have to say. So look, the last few months, the housing market has seen so many changes because of the COVID-19 pandemic. Lockdown has meant that valuers were not able to go and inspect properties. House viewings for both prospective tenants and buyers were stopped. The tenant eviction ban was put in place. Um, payment holidays were made available to borrowers and landlords were encouraged to pass these on to those tenants who were struggling to pay their rent. The economy contracted by the fastest rate in history. Solicitors have struggled as the reality of remote working really hit. Um, lenders have pulled rates, they've scaled back on criteria and some have actually put a pause on your applications or pulled out of the market altogether. And there has been talk of the housing market going into meltdown and real worries about tenants um, not being able to pay their rents. Now, thankfully, we have moved on a bit since the start of lockdown where this kind of list of things that I've just given to you um, came into play and it's certainly a lot calmer now. Valuers are now able to go back out and inspect properties and potential or prospective buyers and tenants are able to go and view properties as well. And house prices thus far actually seem to be holding out. Um, solicitors have found ways to work around um, things and they're able to um, now work to complete remortgages and purchases and working at, at, at speed. And lenders are very much back in the market now um, with criteria much more akin to the pre-lockdown um, situation. And yet, the world is a different place. So we felt that now was the perfect time to bring together our contacts in the industry and bring to you some of the leaders across various um, sectors within the market and ask them to come and share with you their thoughts on what's been happening, um, how it's impacted their respective parts of the industry and also give you their thoughts for what's going to happen in the future and hopefully also share you some advice to help you just finish riding out this storm. So thank you for joining us today. For those of you who are new to Mortgages for Business, just a few words about us. We are a whole of market mortgage brokerage and we specialise in all types of first charge lending. So by that, what I mean is um, homeowner mortgages, buy to let, commercial investment, commercial owner occupier, bridging finance and development finance. We as a firm have been in the industry for 30 years now and we have weathered um, recessions, financial crises and now to add to our list we have pandemics. Um, our mission is to ensure that our clients have great financial outcomes and our ethos is very much um, that our clients should be able to make informed decisions. And so to this end what you will find is that we very much work on the basis of sharing information with you, um, not just on interest rates but on the market as a whole so we regulatively talk about legislative changes the housing market and really all things that impact our clients and we do this by sending out a weekly newsletter which is free to access and also by putting on our website blogs case studies and other information so enough about us um, our agenda for this afternoon is going to be as follows we're going to start off with our panel debate and we're going to be joined by David Whitaker, CEO of Keystone Property Finance and Adrian Maloney, Group Sales Director of One Savings Bank. And this debate is going to be hosted by Managing Director of Mortgages for Business, Steve Alenik. We're then going to be catching up with Simon Jago, Managing Director of Allied Property Surveyors. And then we'll be speaking to Vanessa Warwick, co-founder of Property Tribes. Our last guest is going to be Julian Sampson, partner and head of lending at TWM Solicitors. And finally, we're going to be finishing off with myself answering some of the questions that you have sent in to us in advance of today's event. So it's time for our first session and I am delighted to hand over to Steve Lanick, Managing Director of Mortgages for Business um, for our panel debate. Our guests here are going to be David Whitaker, CEO of Keystone Property Finance. Now, Keystone is a specialist lender who take a really bespoke approach to their underwriting. David has been in the mortgage industry for many years now, and his broad knowledge of the market is simply incredible. Um, he's regularly asked for opinion by the press and often speaks at landlord events, and he's quite known for being both open and frank. 
Adrian Maloney is Group Sales Director at One Savings Bank. Now, One Savings Bank is a specialist lender who focuses on the underserved subsectors of the mortgage market, supported by a strong retail savings franchise. Now, their brands include Kent Reliance, Interbay, Precise Mortgages, Prestige and Heritable. So Adrian has a holistic view on all sides of the investment mortgage market. So I'd like to hand over to Steve Lanick for our panel debate. So good afternoon and um, welcome to our specialist buy to let lender session. I'm delighted to say that I'm joined by two heavyweights in the buy to let mortgage market to give us their current view on current events in the market and to answer some of the questions that landlords have been sending in to us. So a couple of introductions. Um, our first guest today is Adrian Maloney, Group Sales Director at One Savings Bank. Um, Adrian has been in the industry for I think it's over 21 years now, Adrian, with roles at Fortnum Building Fuck. Society, uh, Mortgage Trust nationwide, uh, before taking the sales director role at One Savings Bank. Uh, Adrian was heavily involved, I think, in the merger between OSB and Charter Court Financial Services and as Group Sales Director. So Adrian's now charge of, I think, three specialist uh, lenders, Correct, yeah. Reliance, Precise Mortgages and Interbay Commercial. So it's great to have Adrian here with his experience in the sector. Um, Adrian's also a highly respected industry spokesman and keynote speaker, it says here and was named Mortgage Personality of the Year in uh, the Mortgage Strategy Awards in 2018. So welcome, Adrian, and thank you for giving up your time today. Good afternoon, Steve. Thank you. Talking of experience, uh, <laughs> our second guest is another, none other than Mr. David Whittaker, uh, CEO of Keystone Property Finance and Group CEO of the Property Business Group, which includes Mortgages for Business. Many of our viewers will know David from his MFB days. Um, which he set up some 30 years ago. I think it is this year, David. Um, David this year, 30 yes. years. David's been specialising in the complex end of buy to let ever since. Um, known as a colourful figure in the industry, David's renowned for telling it like it is. I don't I know it? And is a regular commentator in the national and trade press. And like Adrian, David was also voted Mortgage Personality of the Year. Uh, in the Mortgage Strategy Awards, I think, a year before Adrian, in 2017. Uh, <laughs> and in 2007, David set up Keystone as a lending brand. Um, and I think it was 2018, became a fully-fledged specialist buy-to-let lender. A sort of poacher turned gamekeeper, I believe is the expression. So welcome, David. Many thanks again for taking part today. Thanks, Steve. So I'm conscious of time and... Um, We've got a few landlord questions to get through, but I thought I'd just be good to kick off with a general question of how you guys have had to adapt your business during the, the pandemic. Um, and so what challenges you've faced in, in serving your clients? So maybe Adrian, you can pick that up first. How, how have you found yeah. things at OSB? Yeah, I mean, I mean like everyone, um, everyone else, we, 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 we've got the vast majority of people in our business um, remotely working now, Steve, um, about 75% of, of, of our workforce, which for a sizable bank like One Savings Bank uh, and in a very quick period of time um, was, was quite a move. And that, that, that sort of coupled at the same time when the announcement came out about the mortgage payment holidays, or, or I'm sure we'll debate them later, more, more, more the mortgage payment deferrals. Um, came into play. So as you're trying to get people working remotely, we had to, to, to deal with an influx of, of inquiries on that and sort of move people around operationally to, to, to help deal with the, the queries for our, our existing customers. Whilst obviously, you know, I think like everyone looking at the priority, which was maintaining the safety of, uh, of the, the staff of One Savings Bank and getting them working remotely. So that came with its own challenges, but we dealt with that quickly. Um, you know, one of the, the, the biggest challenges for most lenders in the, in the specialist um, uh, mortgage uh, sector, particularly in buy-to-let, was the use of physical valuations, which I guess came to a, a grinding halt. And we were fortunate enough to, we, we've got a very good proposition team to be able to react quite quickly during that time and bring out, a, a, I guess, a limited um, offering around um, desktop valuations. Obviously, we've now seen the return um, of physical valuations and we've been able to get our product set fully functioning now across all our product lines. As, as you said earlier, we, we run a multi-brand strategy um, underneath the, the OSB um, umbrella, and all of those lines now have a product offering, focusing pr primarily on, you know, our, our, I guess, our core markets, which includes um, buy-to-let, 
Um, so so that, that's all out there now at the moment. Um, I think the really Im- impressive bit has been, you know, not just for our business, I'm sure David will come on and be able to tell you what's happened at Keystone, is that, you know, this time around, the, I guess the, the mortgage business did not come to a grinding halt. Applications were still processed while the relevant information was in there. Um, and actually, the, importantly for clients, things like completions, whether that was refinances or indeed some of the purchases during that period, which were allowed, still continue to, to take place. So I think we're, whatever it is, 10, 11 weeks into this now, yeah. and we're starting to see early signs. I don't know if normality is the, is, is, the, is, is the right word, but early signs of getting back to some form of, of, of business processing and seeing transactions go through with the return of those valuations. Yeah, it's a new normal, I think they're calling it, aren't they? Yeah. Well, <laughs> David, have you had similar experiences? How have you found it? Well, we, we differ slightly for, from One Savings Bank in a key respect. I'll come to in a moment. And, and well done to Adrian and his colleagues keeping going with AVMs, which, which isn't our available route to continue. But not like many of your landlords, Steve, um, we all have a business continuity plan and you dust it off occasionally, you play with it and you congratulate yourself on testing one-tenth of it. But when you have to do it for hard and fast in reality, there's a few nervous moments. And we did actually test run it two weeks before we went into hard lockdown. And I think you'll agree with me, because you looked at the MFB, it kind of mostly worked, but we did do it 100%. So we went into total lockdown on the 17th of March, and then we reached out to our respective IT departments and said, and boys and girls, that includes you. And they went, oh, uh, really? Oh, yes, it includes you as well. So I think by 5 p.m. on the 17th of March, all businesses were in 100% in lockdown. Now they're having people go back into the offices to do health and safety checks and run taps for Legionella and all that sort of stuff. We've stayed away from the building since then. I think a couple of things that have changed for us, and, and we will stick with, and I'm sure Adrian will echo this as well, you know, independent legal advice for directors of limited companies makes up 55% of my book. It's a high figure for one savings bank. You know, they're renowned experts in it. We now do that by video call. That's a, that's a win. Um, I think we used to get about 80% of our documents electronically for completion. We now get 100% of our documents electronically for completion. And there's no reason to go back from that. Correct. So these yeah. are all wins that we wanted to do that are now had to be done uh, out of absolute necessity. So I think that's all good news. But as Adrian's already alluded to, you know, evaluation stopped on the 23rd of March. So our world stopped. You either had an offer or... Yeah. A valuation report was going to come back the next few days, we could get your offer out. But you had a whole chunk of business that was being worked on that couldn't get past the valuation point. So that has only come back to us since the 18th of May, and, and no doubt you'll challenge us on that shortly. So we focused our efforts on getting the stuff out the door. So funny enough, in April and May, we've had some of our best completion months ever, as we threw all of our resources at helping our landlords, who've got cheap rates of offer from us, and indeed cheap rates of offer from One Savings Bank, get those over the line. Because I think, and you may challenge us again on that later, I think there'll come a time where what we're looking at today will be a distant memory for people uh, and they'll wish they took rates in, in 2019 and 2020. So we, we've had a slightly different journey for, from Adrian because we didn't take ABMs. We can't. We're a non-bank lender. Non-bank lenders don't like ABMs. We can't write it onto our balance sheets. So we had to wait until the 18th of May when value was let loose from the, the pen again and they've been out in the field. And we're now starting to see that process picking up again, again for us. It's 10, 11 weeks. We've had the end of the beginning. Is this now the beginning of the end? Yeah. Yeah, no, thanks for that. And I think all, I think all businesses across the country are looking at, at different working practices going forward. I think we've all learned a lot, haven't we? Well, I think if you, if you look at just like what we're doing now, um, Steve, the use of, uh, I, I guess, visual, visual communication um, is going to grow. Um, to, I'd echo David's point in, in terms of the legal process. I actually think the legal process has held up really well during, during this time. And I, you know, I, I thank our legal partners for that because you know, they are a very important, uh, I guess, cog in the supply chain and they've managed to get deals over the line, get them completed and, yeah. and keep the supply chain moving over the last 10 or 11 weeks. No, it's good. I mean, you mentioned earlier about the, the government stepping in with various sort of support packages, including the call to lenders to offer mortgage payment holidays. I mean, what levels of payment holiday requests have you seen and what, and what f- effect has it had on you operationally? I mean, David, if you want to pick that one up. Yeah, um, I suppose because we're more at the specialist end, 
uh, and we don't have a mixture of product lines. So in some of the really big lenders, they have a single service center where it takes in residential calls and buy to let down the same telephone line. So they couldn't really pick and choose how they were able to approach it. Yeah. And of course, as a fairly new lender to market, our portfolio was that size as opposed to that size. So we could actually pick up directly with all of those landlords. And when we spoke to a quarter of them and said, have you spoken to your tenant and is your tenant in trouble? They went, oh no, I read it in the Sunday press, normally a certain well-known tabloid. We said, yeah, this isn't some form of entitlement and there will be repercussions for this. Not only will it cost you money, but lenders may get a little bit grumpy with you down the line. So actually 26.2% shuffled off at that point. And we actually took in 80% of the requests in the month of April, and we, we've only had about 4 or 5% in May. Now, whether there's a resurgence of requests as the new rules come into play, I'm not sure. But once we've spoken to many landlords, we picked out the ones that genuinely either had a need for themselves or their tenants were in need, and we've been able to support them. But quite a lot of people, once they thought it through, and indeed, here we would like to thank, I'm sure Adrian would echo this, that landlord forums and broker networks and large brokers like MFB have been very quick to say to landlords, this isn't a free party and this could have consequences. Now, I appreciate it was too late for some, but I think the responsibility that people have shown in getting the right message out, because it was a bit mixed from government, and there's much that government could have done better and indeed should have done better, but this is one area where I think probably forbearance on buy to let and i do try to avoid using the word holidays because that sends all sorts of wrong messages mm. forbearance on buy to let isn't as high as homeowners and indeed landlords should do their jolly best to get off it as quickly as possible i totally agree i mean as you know i've been spending probably the last couple of months telling that trying to advise landlords to avoid payment holidays if they can i mean clearly if there's some in financial distress then it might be the right call but um yeah, I don't think they've slowly really thought through the, the, the consequences further down the line. I mean, Adrian, I guess a lot of yours is, is sort of a residential along with buy to let within the group? Yeah, there's a mixture of residential and buy to let. I think it's in the public domain that, that we were just under 27% of our, um, of our clients uh, applied for payment holidays. Um, and, you know, we had to build a process at the, at the start of that. It was, a, it was a new thing. It came around very quickly. I think David would acknowledge that. Um, and there was a almost like a rush for applications there. We've now built, a, if you like, almost an online process to deal with those requests. Um, I've spoken to you several times, Steve, over the last 10, 11 weeks and, and, and various other people in the, in the broking community. And I think as, as we've gone along that journey, landlords have become more clear of the implications that, you know, actually, in theory, this could cost money because it is a, a deferral, if you like, of, of payment. Um, David used the word holiday earlier, which I think is, is, is probably where some of the confusion um, came in the way it, it, it was named. Um, you know, it's, it, I think we're in a lot clearer place with that now. I think landlords have a, a greater understanding. Um, and I think actually the, the role of which the mortgage broker plays in at advising them about that and, and I guess expressing more of the detail has become more prevalent over the last five or six weeks for me. Yeah, because I think right at the beginning, the headline was that it wouldn't affect their their credit profile if they took a payment holiday and I suppose technically that's correct but do you think those that have taken the holidays will be treated differently when applying for, for finance in the future? No, I, I, I think the bit was it, it was almost a, a, a how was it going to be registered on your credit file Steve and that was it wasn't going to be re registered I guess adversely yeah. um, on there. I think um, look you know as, as lenders we have um, a duty to be lending responsibly I think from a landlord's point of view um, there are probably going to be more questions around over the next few months as we work through this in terms of have you taken a payment holiday? More lenders will probably ask for bank statements to see evidence of, of payments going in and out, for example. On there, I would expect that to, 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 to happen more often. Um, and bear in mind, you know, when the PRA rules came in and David and I spent quite a lot of time discussing right. these and, and yourself, Steve, a few years ago, for those landlords that, that fall into the additional underwriting category, obviously the majority of lenders that, 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 that specialize in that space ask for a cash flow forecast and yeah. perhaps a business plan. And that has obviously got a, a, an element of backing up the story and, and whether or not they can cope with voids. So I think, you know, we're, we're, we're in the early stages of, 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 of sort of as we work through this process. I don't, I, you know, I think, you know, lenders will look for explanations, evidence, um, and perhaps probe more deeply into the application 
than they would have done going into COVID. I don't know if David agrees with, with, with me on that one. Yeah, and I think no one wants to write hard and fast rules for fear of being too tough on a genuine case where a landlord who perhaps has three properties and two of their tenants fell on hard times. You know, one works for an airline, one works for a catering company, and it lost <coughs> two thirds of their income. If they've taken mortgage payment holidays, that's a legitimate case. So when they come to us for a remortgage and all they're looking to do is drive down their future costs, we would look very sympathetically at that. Mm. But then contrast that with someone who comes up today with a purchase and you ask them where the 25% deposit for the purchase comes from and they source list one, bounce back loan, £50,000. Source two, non-payment of my mortgages for three months across all of my lenders, yet I still receive my rent from my tenants. There's assuredly a place for that file and it's underneath my desk with the dog shredding it before <laughs> I get hold of it. Yeah. I don't want to try and make too many rules. No. And everyone will have a sensible view on this going forward. But, but trying to strike those rules at this juncture yeah. could only and result in a, in a negative approach. Yeah. And, and I, sorry, sorry I, I mean, I say the, the bounce back loans, it was, I was going to come on to that next. I mean, we've, I've seen headlines from OSB this week saying, obviously, you wouldn't consider that as a, a legitimate deposit use. I mean, um, as a broker, I come from the old school that you don't, do, you don't borrow your deposit anyway. Um, and so I guess it just goes into that that bucket. And, and I think, Steve, we, we, we came out with clarity around that to give brokers guidance. Um, you know, as David said, you know, the, 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 the black and white hard and fast rules, the market is moving quite quickly at the moment. So, you know, we wanted to give a steer to, to our broker and our landlord clients on that because people have been asking um, the, 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 the questions around yeah. that. I think the, the beauty of the, the buy to let market for in which we play, which Keystone play, for example, is that we look at things on a case by case basis. We have, if you want to call them old school or, or, or very experienced underwriters who can look at the bigger picture. They will, and I, I fully expect them to ask more questions, as I said, yeah. um, around, uh, I, I guess, the liquidity and the, the overall ability to cover voids in the portfolio going forward. Yeah. I'm just finishing the point off on MPH. So it's been extended for potentially another three months. I saw Nationwide came out now sort of saying that it should start affecting their credit profile. And you agree with that? Look, I don't think you can undo the rules when, when, when they came out at the start and, and, the, and the rules were, were you know, were, were there to say, to, you know, I can't quote for, for another lender, but were there to say this wouldn't affect your, your, your credit file. Yeah. And I think as, as lenders, all we're looking to do is protect, um, protect the lending, lend responsibly, and actually, you know, speak to the client and get a greater knowledge of, of why they may have taken a, a, a payment break, for example, payment holiday. Yeah. Um, so I, I think, you know, we've got to be guided by what the original rules were when this came out. We've got to be sensible as lenders in our approach, but do expect more questions for, for, for landlords um, and, and ask for more reasons behind that. Yeah. Good. Thank you. I, I, think, I think the guidance that um, UK Finance put to the regulator, which hopefully made it into the press eventually, was that particularly in the buy to let sector, as you go into phase two, lenders should reach out to the landlord and say, come on genuinely on that property for the avenue where you've asked us to give forbearance, is your tenant in trouble? And if they're not, we would really like you to come off the drug now. Yeah, no, it makes a lot of sense. And for all the reasons that Adrian's already mentioned, you know, there is the roll up cost of the interest on top, but there is now a bit more pressure being exerted on buy to that because it, it has never been and never will be the same as a homeowner loan. It is a business decision, it is a business venture the customer is involved in, and we're now saying to them, we're probably going to ask you to tell us a bit more about these, yeah. and if it's right, we'll continue with it, or it, indeed, if, you, if you've, you've fallen into it in the last few weeks, we'll talk to you about it. But this is the, the, for the very few that would engage with us on a sense of entitlement, we're saying, well, that, that sense of entitlement has gone even in the government guidelines, and I'm afraid we won't be granting it to you. Fine. And, I, and I, I think if we, if, if, we, if, we, if we put this logically, the vast majority of buy to let landlords seek advice from their advisors, such as mortgages for business. And I think um, as we've gone through the weeks, you've seen more landlords speak to their advisors about the implications and getting what I consider is the correct advice or the correct information about what the implications um, can be yes. if, 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 you, if you need to take those and why, when, I guess, 
when, why, and why you shouldn't, in, in some circumstances, be applying for them. I agree. Let's move on to something more positive. You mentioned it earlier, Adrian, value is back out. Um, so can you tell us what you're seeing with regard to sort of turnaround times and the clearance of, of backlog? I, I know there's sort of a, a lot of you specialist buy-to-let lenders use the same valuation firm in Connells. So just wonder what the update was. Look, I, I think they've done a, a, a good job in coming back. We have to remember their, their safety in this as well. There's slightly more rules about getting access to, to, to properties. We've also yeah. started to see the return of, um, you know, David will be familiar with these, the long form valuations as well for the, for the bigger properties. Um, you know, we've sent a message out recently to, to our broker parties just asking for patience at, at this stage. Uh, I mean, I think it's only a, we're only a few weeks in. Yeah. I would expect it to take a little bit of time. I think most... Um, most landlords are patient with the, the situation. They appreciate it. Most brokers are. And, and us as lenders uh, are working with all of our valuation partners to, to work through the backlog and indeed some of the new applications that are, that are coming through at the moment. But we've tried to adopt working on a, a, you know, a date by date basis and working through the backlog first so, so that people who have waited longer um, for, their, for their mortgage valuation and their application to proceed uh, are dealt with in a, in a straight date order. And I think, I think that's the right way to do it at the moment. Feels like a, what, end of June, early July for the backlog to be cleared? I, I, think, uh, I, think, they, sorry, I think they might get there sooner than that. I was going to say they've that. Made, they've made really good strides. They, you know, they only got the good to go on the 18th of May uh, and we're a fortnight in. Um, and they had a big number on their desk to start off with because they, they had all those valuations that were backed up. And here's an organisation, without saying too much about their commercials, that we used to take in upwards of 1,500 a day. Wow, yeah. So they had all that lot to clear. And, and then, of course, you know, in, in each of our factories, we've been assembling a few, not as many as 1,500 a day. So these are all landing on their desks. So as Adrian says, they're going to go through them in, in batting order, unless there's a really genuinely exceptional pressing need. But you know, here's an organisation that used to turn around valuations on an average of three days. Uh, and so we've got to cut them a bit of slack now, you know, yeah. their values have got to negotiate with a homeowner or a tenant or a landlord to go to a property. So they have to park up outside. Then they have to fully PPE up. Then they have to see that the landlord's going to walk down the road for 20 minutes whilst they do the property. You know, this job is not the same job as they used to do. And well, thankfully it's a bit cooler outside today, but for the last two weeks, it, it's been 23 to 26 degrees in every point south of the, the Watford Gap. So, yeah. you know, the, the guys have been finding it quite hard work. So I, I think by and large, you know, we're, we're, we started off, and I think Adrian, you sent the same message, say you should allow three to four weeks for valuations to take place. If I was saying that message this Friday, I'm going to say 10 to 12 days, but you might get lucky in a postcode area where there isn't a backlog and you may find it coming back in three to four days. And it doesn't mean they're not doing a damn good job. It's yeah. just a you can't unilaterally apply a single metric across the whole United Kingdom. So I, I think they've done a good job. And on the long form reports, the special firm that we use, quite enough, we're almost quicker off the mark. Uh, and they're right on top of it. So, you know, well, well on the value is they're out there. It's not the same norm. It's a new, it's a new norm. But, you know, in the process that, you know, a transaction from start to finish is measured not in weeks, but in months. Whether the values get to it in three days or eight days or nine days is, isn't a killer. Yeah. But are you expecting a raft of down valuations, though, in the current climate? I think a credit risk person would tell you they're an accurate market appraisal, Steve, rather than um, a, a down valuation. So um, I, uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, look, I, 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 I think we're seeing the early reports come back in. It's very difficult with transactions over the period where there's, there, there's, there's been a gap. Um, and we're only just starting to get those reports back now. Yeah. So I, I, haven't, I haven't seen too much evidence of it. I don't know if that would be the case from, from you or David. So, um, but, you know, I, I, I think uh, to echo what David said before, we, we, we need to give our surveying partners a pat on the back at the moment because they've got back to it quickly. They're working hard with it. And it's not the easiest environment to, 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 to have comparables over a recent period of time either. Yeah. So uh, that information is going to come out over the next two or three weeks, isn't it? So we're... We'll yeah, it. I think their guidance thus far, Steve, is they will refer to evidential data, which will probably, as Adrian say, predate it. Yeah. The RICS has directed all valuers to insert a, a standard health and warning clause. But Connells feel confident that in the high density areas of the big cities, they'll be able to take that off fairly quickly and start reporting live data. Anecdotally, they're starting to tell us about 
sold subject to contract, which in a formal world is the first thing you would totally ignore because it's not a yeah. done deal. Yeah. But for, the, for that evidence gap that you've just mentioned, yeah. it's a guide that either gives us confidence or, or, or gives us some extra tonality. So I, I think that, as Adrian says, the jury's still out. We, we track the data coming back in daily. But as you would know, a statistical sample only has validity when you have a good number of valuations behind it. Yeah. And none of us are at that point with having enough data to start saying, well, it was analytically 2% marked down historically. Is it now 3.5%? You know, it's, yeah. there'll be people giving lots of sound bites on what it should or shouldn't be. I, I think I joined Adrian. Let's just wait and see. Yeah, wise words. So again, conscious of time. So I'll finish off with a, um, a couple of questions and, and then we'll, we'll call it a day. But the, 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 the penultimate question is really around interest rates. Now, you know, we get a lot of calls from landlords saying base rates obviously down to almost zero, um, yet lenders seem to be increasing rates. And I know both Kent Reliance, Precise and Keystone have recently increased mortgage products. Can can you help me explain to landlords why that's happened? I mean, maybe Adrian, you can pick that one up first. Yeah, look, we, 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 we've still got to manage capacity, Steve, and we're still trying to work out what the, the, the new normal is at the moment. Um, obviously, fixed rates anyway aren't linked to, to, to base rate in the main, and predominantly landlords, the, or the offering we've got is around two and five year fixed rates. But, you know, we, we still have a, an awful lot of our workforce working remotely, you know, when the moment's right, we want to get them back into the office and get them back into it, in, into it safely. And actually, you know, trying to work out what the flow of new business was, was going to be on those rates is, you know, you, you, you're going out there with a, almost a bit of a guess. Um, but I think there's a, there's a little bit of that's there to manage capacity. But there's also an element of, of pricing for risk. You know, we've just talked about house prices. Um, you know, we're still to wait to see what, what, what happens there. And also, you know, what is going to happen to, to landlords, tenants and profiles uh, along the journey over the next few months um, as we see people either potentially being coming off furlough, what's going to happen with, with, with the jobs market. Um, so I think the, the, these rates are there. I still think they're good value, to be honest with you. I don't think anyone can turn around and look at the rates in the market. We've been around a long time, the three of us, um, and we've seen <laughs> rates certainly more expensive than what are out there at the moment. Um, so, so, you know, I, I think part of it's about capacity managing capacity part of it is that you're seeing the competition all or, or, or the rates all been around the same amount at the moment as people look to see what what the what the market's going to look like going forward for the for the short to medium term and david are you driven by also what other lenders are doing in the market you know, when, when you're looking at your pricing yeah i think like adrian yeah you know, we're all working remotely so if i find myself at the top of the flagpole yeah we would just get in too much work and we wouldn't know we're able to support anyone. We'd just, we'd just go under. Yeah. yeah. Technology is wonderful, but it's not, it's not the sole substitute for how you, how you run a total business. But, but yeah, there was plenty of commentary as we came into late 2019 and early 2020, that competition had driven the pricing down too low. Yeah. Less so in our sector, but in the, but certainly so in the mainstream residential sector. Yeah. And there was a lot of, muttering well how, how how does this how do we come away from all of this uh, and you'd say that some lenders and um i know one savings bank would never do it and you know i'd never do it but some lenders were, were lending almost on vanity yeah and it, whichever way you stacked your spreadsheet and shook it they couldn't be making money so this is coming together as adrian said with risk and with capacity and a little less competition as people say everyone's had a great time from the second half of 2019 and the opening months of 2020 is this now stabilizing out? And the underlying swap rates aren't following bank base rate down. They've come back up a bit. They're saying at the end of this, there's going to be a new norm. If you're taking a five-year rate, this is looking out not over the next 12 months, it's looking over 60 months. So as Adrian says, you know, still to see 75% loan to value five-year fixes in the mid to high threes is, is actually where we were about a year ago. Yeah. So Will competition drive it back down before the end of this year? I don't get the sense. Ask Adrian and I this question again next spring. You may well find as a, as a real margin it's come down, but then the underlying cost might have gone up. Yeah. So who, who knows is, when is the best time to strike? But a five-year rate in the mid threes, when your yields are no doubt going to improve, because if prices come off the top and rental demand remains high, your yield that was stuck at five might go to five and a half percent. 
and if you're leveraging off money from Asian or, or, or others in the mid, mid to high threes, that looks a pretty slam dunk business equation to me. And, and, and I think, look, I think that there's some positive outlooks for, for, for landlords as well, because you might find people who were potentially looking to get onto the housing market, delaying that decision and, and looking to continue in the, in the private rental sector for a period of time. So, yeah. you know, back, back to the point, I still think that the rates and the products you see out there offer good value for money. Um, and I think you'll still see landlords look at them and think that, that that's a good deal to take. Yeah, which leads nicely on to the, the, the crystal ball question on um, you know, the outlook for specialist buy-to-let over the next sort of 12, 18 months. I know we've touched upon him there about sort of pricing, but how do you see the, the wider buy-to-let market to, to finish off today? David, your, your view on, on how it's set fair for landlords? I mean, my opinion is I think landlords are, um, should stick to it and I think there's great opportunities for them. Well, they've certainly had to absorb their, more than their fair share of knocks over the last four years on a political and taxation front. Yeah. So if they've, if they've got this far uh, and they're well established, I, I think the, sadly there'll be some people who have to sell houses in the next year because of their overall employment basis. Yeah. So landlords will be able to pick up properties quite readily. You know, some of our first time buyers, the millennials, won't be in a position to buy. So landlords may be able to buy, buy well. Uh, and I think, you know, if money remains where it is for a period of time and the rents remain strong, in fact, improve, it, it's a good model for landlords. The only question I have, and really yet to get to the bottom of it, is, is for those of us who sit on HMOs, how, how willingly are tenants in HMOs going to be wishing to occupy those properties where, where they share central facilities in a continuing concern about future waves of, of a virus which we don't yet have a vaccine or, or regular medicine antidote. Mm. So there's lots of questions to think about on HMOs, but the mainstream buy flat market with ordinary flats and houses and bungalows, I would have thought it, it may wobble for a month or two as mixed messages come out, but I, I can see in a year's time, it will look relatively the same as it does today. Yeah, you, you'd agree with that, Adrian? Uh, no, I think buy to let is still a, a good investment. There's still good returns to be made. You know, as David said, it is an investment. Um, you know, and if an investment isn't working, people can always change their investment strategy, and that might be around changing the the type of property they want to to, to buy um, or or invest in. Um, I also think it's interesting. You know, we, we're we're coming out of this, or, or, or sort of twelve weeks into in, into where we are today. This is this is very different to the last downturn in terms of lenders having liquidity and money to lend and wanting to lend. So there is finance there for landlords. And I think the interesting bit is that if you look back to, to, to perhaps 08 or 09, what we didn't see then was an abundance of landlords getting rid of their investments. And I don't think you'll see that now. And I think to David's point, there could be some opportunities in terms of properties coming onto the market that landlords wish to purchase and, or, or, or wish to use to, to, to further their investments. So, you know, I, I'm I keep using this so cautiously optimistic, I think, is the, the way I would put it. Excellent. And I think that's a great, great note to leave it on. Um, thanks, both of you, gents, for, for giving up your time yeah. today. I really appreciate it. I wish you both all the best for steering the businesses through to, to the other end of this, um, whatever the new normal looks like. Um, but thanks again, and I'll see you both soon. Thanks, thanks Steve. Thank you. Steve, David and Adrian, thank you so much. That was really interesting and I really enjoyed hearing what you had to say. Thank you. Next up, I'm delighted to be joined by Vanessa Warwick, co-founder of Property Tribes. Now, for those who aren't familiar with Property Tribes, um, Property Tribes is a online um, community space with over 60,000 members. Um, it's a place where landlords and investors can go to find information on basically anything property related. Um, Vanessa is um, a true um, champion for landlords and so we're incredibly fortunate that she's got the time to join us today. The reason we really wanted Vanessa to come along and speak with us is to give you um, a kind of view on what the landlords are feeling and their experiences on the back of lockdown and also how they're feeling about the future. So delighted today to be joined by Vanessa. Vanessa, thank you so much for joining us today. We really appreciate you taking some time. Now, Property Tribes has some 60,000 members. And so we'd really love to hear from you about how the landlord community is feeling right now um, about their property investments and whether they really have confidence in staying in the buy-to-let space going forwards. 
Well, that's a really great question, Jenny, and thank you for having me on this Mortgages for Business um, Investing in the New Normal webinar, because I think it's such a good title because, you know, we're all having to come to terms with the new normal. It's not going to go back to how it was before. We've had an entire recalibration of everything that we thought we knew about being a landlord, being a property investor. And, you know, when the lockdown was first announced, um, it was very much people going into crisis mode. And when people are in a crisis mode, it's very acute for the first, you know, 24, 48 hours. They feel um, fear, anxiety, dread, uncertainty, hopelessness, helplessness. Um, and when you're in a crisis situation, one thing I've learned myself from my own life is not to make knee jerk decisions when there's a very, very fluid situation. It's unfolding in real time. And I think, unfortunately, <clears throat> some landlords who made knee jerk decisions during those first few days may live to regret those decisions. I think it's very important to keep your cool, get the right information from the right official sources as it, as it comes through, process that information for a few days, um, and then kind of see how it affects you as an individual and then make some actions based on that. Um, so I think initially there was all these emotions and shock and people naturally very, very worried about their, their, their landlord business. Um, and then, you know, it starts to calm down, information starts to become clearer, uh, and then people can take a more pragmatic view. But I have to say the government have a lot to answer for in some of their very early communications regarding the, the private sector. Um, you know, obviously I do understand it was a crisis situation and, and it was unprecedented, but, you know, calling the the mortgage deferment a mortgage holiday was was not clever it gave tenants the impression that landlords didn't need to pay their mortgages and therefore we've had a lot of landlords reporting on property tribes that their tenants have contacted them saying well you're having a mortgage uh, holiday uh, courtesy of the government so i won't pay my rent so i think the communication was quite poor mm -hmm. in the early days and i think everything we've tried to do at property tribes is you know, stay calm, get the right advice from the right experts um, and really encourage landlords just to, uh, you know, think carefully about all the actions they're taking during this kind of very acute period because it will impact your, your business going forwards. Sure, sure. Thank you. And I guess um, in terms of when you're speaking to your members, I mean, is it paying mortgages is the biggest concerns at the moment is it repossessions you know what are they really concerned about just now well all of our discussions um we've actually created a new category on property tribes to host them because there's there's so many of them we've called this category coronanomics and i think that reflects on the title of this webinar that we are in the new normal and coronavirus is going to affect every aspect of everything that we're doing and beyond. So um, yes, the, the, the first thing that came through was many, many landlords finding that tenants were not paying the rent and obviously very concerned about that, what measures were there to assist them. And one of the things that, that we did uh, actually just before lockdown was we traveled up to London and we did an interview with um, housing and tenant solicitor, David Smith uh, about you know what landlords can do um, if if tenants are you know struggling to pay the rent and uh, he helped us create a template letter to write to tenants um, trying to encourage them to at least make a partial payment and then to think about how they'll repay the rent once they're back into um, you know a more stable financial position so we've tried to put resources out there for those that that are struggling um, very much a case of across the board uh you know tenants not paying rent landlords very worried uh, also issues of of properties becoming void through the lockdown period uh and and how can we retenant our properties particularly an issue for hmos where you've got shared households uh, lots of additional issues there um but i think you know all of these issues are going to be ongoing jenny because 
we're just uh, in the phase now of furlough being um, gradually withdrawn and there's going to be a lot more rent arrears to come, I fear, because obviously there are a lot of people out there that actually don't know yet that they don't have a job to go back to. And also uh, there's going to be people out there who are in the vulnerable category, such as underlying you know, health conditions or um, you know, other issues that make them more vulnerable to COVID, they're not going to want to go back to work either. So they may well have to, uh, you know, take a temporary leave of absence from their job or go on to housing benefit if their supplier won't continue to support them. So we're actually only at the start of all of this. Uh, I kind of describe the lockdown COVID-19 as the, the kind of earthquake then lockdown was where the waters start to recede and there's that famous saying um, when the tide goes out you see who's swimming naked but actually we've got this tsunami on the horizon I don't know how big it is it might be a one foot wave it might be a, a 30 foot wave a hundred foot wave I don't know but it is coming and that is the fallout of all of this on an economic level so business models um, and landlords business models and developers and everybody in the property sector, their business models have been severely tested and that test, I fear, is going to continue. Is there anything for the, um, particularly for the landlords, in terms of what might be coming, any advice you could maybe give to them to help them prepare for the worst? Yes, I think there is. I think you need to look at your business very, very carefully. Make sure you understand it. See where the weaknesses might be. And Nick and I um, have recently got involved with some incredible um, portfolio management software called Lendlord. Uh, Nick's taken a minor shareholding in it. And this software is, is just made for this uh, ongoing scenario because it has a module in it where you can actually stress test your portfolio. Um, you can stress test it against LHA rents um, and it highlights to you the weak performing properties and those are the ones that you probably need to give most attention to and I think also tenant relationships and tenant communication has actually been massively in the spotlight over this period and those landlords that nurtured and had good relationships with their tenants even through a you know letting agent on a fully managed basis they will have found this a lot easier to deal with than those landlords that don't have good relationships and haven't nurtured those relationships with tenants because very much this has very much been a case of um, us working together to get through the worst of this um, and it's where you know landlords that have really nurtured relationships have, have, have really benefited from doing that so I would say definitely understand your portfolio from every angle using a free piece of software like Lendlord and definitely nurture uh, relationships, understand your tenant's position. If they need financial help, um, there's many options open to them, uh, including obviously going into receipt of LHA or UC, help them find their way to that support. Perfect, that's really good advice, thank you. And have you um, noticed a change with your members in terms of the kinds of properties they're thinking about investing in? Are they looking to diversify away from residential or maybe looking more at mixed use at the moment? Or are they sticking more to their guns and continuing with what they've been doing previously? Very interesting question because I've, we've seen our, our, our members, our community, talking about all of those different things. Some feel uh, probably the more established larger landlords feel that um, they're just going to batten down the hatches, mm. ride out the storm and then see where the opportunities are. Um, newbies are coming in uh, asking, you know, what's the best uh, place to invest, the best type of property to invest in. And actually, if we think about it, the, the fundamentals about investing in property haven't actually changed. 
Um, but there are certain risks that have been massively amplified by COVID-19. And I would say that one of those is, is obviously choosing tenants. And I think that when you are researching a, um, a suitable buy-to-let property, you, you really need to find the tenant demand first before you think about creating a supply. You need customers for your your business, so to speak. So I think landlords are going to have to become a lot more uh, expert in tenant referencing because, um, you know, we've had many, many industries and sectors affected by COVID. I, I, I always, you know, cite the aviation industry. It's had a massive negative impact. Uh, that industry is, is, is shrinking. I mean, if, if, uh, our neighbour actually is a pilot and with British Airways and he said that 75% of British Airways pilots are being laid off. Now, you know, that's his, his um, version of what's happening, but you know, that the aviation industry, it's not just that industry, it's all the sub industries that support it, like all the airport workers, um, you know, the cabin crew, the people that provide the, the food for aircraft meals, uh, the servicing department, you know, it has a massive impact. So we're going to see areas that are heavily dominated by one industry. We're going to see the tenant demand there possibly change quite significantly. You know, Derby uh, is where they make the engines for uh, aircraft. Now they're having to cut their workforce. So when you've got properties in um, all in one area where a major employer is affected then it can kind of have a really serious impact on your business so i think you know landlords coming into this are going to have to and indeed those that are thinking of you know expanding their portfolios definitely going to have to really dig deep on on tenant uh, demand in an area and fully understand it um and really look to uh, minimize risks at even more so because so many of the risks of being a landlord have been amplified by COVID-19 crisis. Yeah, thank you. Um, in terms of some advice for landlords who are looking at the new normal as we're calling it and um, really if you have any sort of, yeah, advice or tips for them in terms of going forwards, how they can make their business successful going forwards um, yeah, with the, in terms of a post-COVID world. I think uh, getting good advice from reputable sources is absolutely vital. There is a lot of uh, very bad advice out there, particularly on places like YouTube and Facebook. Um, obviously, the government is a good source of advice. Uh, hopefully, people regard property tribes as a good source of advice. The uh, National Residential Landlords Association has a lot of resources for landlords and I recommend that everybody should join and take advantage of those resources. Um, the lovely Kate Faulkner um, is producing some very helpful resources for landlords on her website, Property Checklists. So there is good information out there, but I think the, 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 the main thing that all landlords need to be doing is really, really engaging with uh, this whole um, scenario that's unfolding. It is not a time to bury your head in the sand, um, think it's not gonna affect you, uh, think it's all gonna be over in three weeks time, it's not. This is a time where I suspect smaller, less uh, engaged landlords will be the ones that, that, that don't survive. Um, there will be some kind of clearing out of landlords in the sector depending on whether they've adopted high risk strategies um, in, in the past. So there's so much to come out in the wash about all of this and we're only just in the initial cycle of the washing machine in my opinion, um, even the pre-wash. So I think just really landlords have got to engage um, thoroughly with everything that's you know coming out in the wash in the sector understand it see how it applies to what they're doing and constantly tweak and adapt what they're doing um, and then you know really get the right advice from the right um, sources uh, we should also mention professional advice such as tax advisors mortgage brokers like mortgages for business um, 
you know professionals are there to help and support and you can tap into their advice so in these you know very challenging times it would be foolish not to gather a team of people around you who are going to support you through it thank you and one last thing i just wanted to ask you is um, there's lots of government support available for businesses and landlords and i just wonder if you had any thoughts or comments you'd want to share on the um, yeah the various government support available at the moment yes um well i've been quite uh, opinionated on this topic um and uh when the mortgage deferment uh holiday uh, i don't want to use a hot word holiday ah <laughs> when the mortgage uh, deferment uh payment deferment was announced um i immediately put a post onto property tribe saying i would not be uh, accessing it unless i absolutely absolutely had to um my view was a don't do anything as a knee-jerk reaction to something which i touched on earlier because at that point, um, none of us had had our rent roll in for the following months. So we actually didn't know whether our tenants were going to struggle. Um, so I put this post up and, you know, it's interesting to see uh, overwhelmingly the property tribes community agreed with me that you shouldn't reach for that measure unless you are absolutely, um, you know, on your last leg, so to speak. Because to my mind, we're in a game where we don't actually know what, what the rules are you never ever play your ace card until you need to and you know getting a mortgage deferment to me was something of an ace card if it turned out that you know 10 of my tenants stopped paying the rent thankfully that hasn't happened i've only had one tenant that went on to 50 percent rent for two months so I've, I've been very fortunate but i know others haven't uh, been as fortunate and indeed if they need that card then you should play it but only if you're absolutely desperate and then we had all the bounce back loans coming through and um you know we've had various uh, property gurus on youtube telling people to get a bounce back loan even if you don't need it uh, use it to as a deposit on a property or to buy a, a property for cash um, and jenny i'm sure you're like ah what's this <laughs> because obviously uh you know the bounce back loans were specifically and i actually going to quote the british business bank they were loans for businesses adversely affected by covid19 so if you take a bank bounce back loan you're actually signaling that your business model was a little bit weak and that you couldn't survive without government support now think about that when this has all calmed down and you go to apply for um, lending, you know, if you've got a bounce back loan in your backstory, do you think lenders are going to take that into account with the underwriting? And indeed, in just the last few days, we've started to see that they are. Paragon have added COVID-19 underwriting to their criteria. So additionally, if you did take the full 50, k loan i think it's a payment of somewhere around 930 pounds a month in a year's time when it kicks in so how's that going to affect your affordability when you're paying out an additional 930 pounds a month so again my advice was right at the beginning is not to reach for these government measures unless you absolutely have to now they did say at the time that people wouldn't be penalized on a credit basis if they took a mortgage deferment or if they took government measure support. But now, <laughs> in hindsight, when all this terrible crisis has died down and people have had a chance to process it all, Jenny, I'm sure you'll agree with me, we're starting to see the lenders now bringing in underwriting uh, with regards to COVID-19 support measures. And it, it could affect your ability to grow your portfolio at a time when there's potentially some good opportunities around. Yeah, I mean, we're definitely seeing um, lenders asking questions about payment holidays, particularly, and also um, if your source of deposit is some kind of government loan, they're saying that we won't be interested in lending there either. And I think the example we always give, give is if we say to a lender, you know, I have this portfolio of property, but I couldn't maintain my payments here, but please can you give me a mortgage on another property over here? You know, it doesn't really give a, a good message to the lender. So absolutely lenders are um, either asking lots more questions around the customer's um, financial viability or indeed simply declining applications for those mm. who have taken 
the payment holidays. So yes, I think you're absolutely right in everything you're saying. So thank you for that. So Vanessa, I think that's us for today. So thank you so much for spending some time with me. I've really enjoyed chatting to you as always. And um, yeah, hopefully we'll catch up with you again soon. Well, thank you very much for inviting me onto this um, Zoom call, uh, Jenny. It's been a pleasure speaking to you as always. And thank you to you for everything that you do to support the landlord community. Um, you're a great resource to all of us. Thank you. So next, I'm delighted to welcome Simon Jago, Managing Director of Allied Property Surveyors to our event. Now, um, Allied Surveyors are a firm with over 120 surveyors across England and Wales, and they do both residential and commercial valuations, um, not just for mortgage purposes, but also for insurance, probate and tax. Now, we felt that at the moment, um, there's a lot of um, question marks with regards to how valuers are actually placing values on properties um, when someone's applying for a mortgage, what figure should they put down as their property value, um, and also some concerns around the future of house prices. So we felt that a representative from the um, surveying um, part of the industry would be the perfect accompaniment to answer some of the question marks that are probably in your head at the moment. So I'd be delighted to welcome Simon Jago. Simon, thank you so much for joining us today. We're delighted to have you at our landlord event. Um, I guess you're probably very busy at the moment with surveyors going back out to visit properties after lockdown. So I guess it'd be really great for our um, listeners to um, get an understanding of what sort of timeframes are currently involved in terms of getting a survey booked in. Absolutely. Well, we've been um, back in uh, processing inspections now on Allied Surveyors since around the 18th of May. Um, a few were done in the end of that week prior, um, following the government restrictions being lifted um, and the safe inspections to take place. Um, there was an initial bottleneck of, uh, of obviously the pipeline instructions when we returned, um, particularly on the more complex assets which could not be processed by any form of desktop assessment. Um, but we are obviously three and a bit weeks into that um, inspection process now. We're around 80% uh, complete on that backlog or pipeline. Um, so we're certainly working our way through, which is positive. Um, in terms of current availability levels we, we obviously have a split depending on the type of asset that we are inspecting and reporting on so on true residential or single buy to lets currently looking at around five to seven days um, on small hmos which are done on the hybrid reports typically around seven to ten days and on your more complex commercial style reports so that be your multi-unit blocks your sui generous hmos and true commercial assets. Um, we're looking at around 10 to 12 days, which is not now dissimilar to what we have seen prior to um, the lockdown period. Clearly, we're in a slightly different world now than we were in uh, pre-COVID scenario. So we've got um, PPE to take care of, inspection protocols, which have to be adhered to. Um, and obviously, since the, only the 1st of June for many, um, estate agents have only just started opening back up and so access issues um, were a concern or an issue um, prior to that date in getting access to properties. We have um, obviously still got a lockdown position in Wales so at the current time we're not able to process any inspections in that location um, but we are hopeful there will be a further government update on the 18th of June um, and so we'll see what that brings. On the uh, panel management side of our business, we, we get a greater view of what the, our colleagues and other valuation businesses are doing. Um, that capacity is opening up on a weekly basis um, where valuers are returning from furlough and that's also just being managed depending on each company's um, level of instruction to, uh, at the current time. Um, but all positive, um, the feedback we've been getting from valuers has been good in terms of um, protocols being adhered to. Um, so it's good news generally. That's fantastic. So I think when um, the valuers first uh, started going back out, people were expecting it to take months for things to get back to normal. So it sounds like you guys have done an incredible job. 
Yeah, I think we were back inspecting far sooner than we probably anticipated. I think we, we potentially thought it might be at some point in June at the very earliest. And so um, returning in, in May was, was pleasing um, and we had all of our documentation and uh, processes uh, ready and waiting to go as of that date. Thank you. And so you mentioned um, a moment ago about the protocols for valuers going into properties. So what yeah. advice would you be able to give to um, any um, applicants who are expecting or due to have a valuation to make sure their property is safe and therefore can be inspected? Well, we um, have drafted um, specific guidance which we are both explaining and emailing to clients and key holders and applicants um, and we can provide that document on request also. When the valuer um, or the valuer's admin team are phoning to book appointments, um, the details of that um, process will be um, relayed over that phone call and the value will also phone on the day of inspection just to rerun through um, what will take place at the property on that day. So we are expecting properties to be um, fully ventilated, so all windows and doors open um, externally and internally. Internal doors, if it's a HMO, um, then those should be chopped open just to minimise the level of contact that the valuer has to have with any element of the subject property. All uh, vendors, tenants, um, occupiers are expected to vacate the property 45 minutes prior to the inspection taking place um, and where possible just to reside in the garden or in their vehicles uh, for the duration of that visit. We, we've obviously been uh, rather fortunate in recent weeks, Jenny, where uh, we've had rather nice weather and so it's been quite easy to ask people to um, vacate to their gardens. Obviously, we're not always going to be in that fortunate position. So the value will um, have an element of discretion. And so if it's safe for all tenants to reside in one communal room in the property, for example, then this will probably be acceptable. Um, as I mentioned earlier, feedback so far from the inspections we have taken place has been extremely uh, positive um, because I think everyone's taken the, the current position extremely seriously. That's fantastic. Okay, thank you. And I guess um, it must be quite hard for valuers to um, place values on property at the moment given the lack of any recent sales transactions going through. So how, how are they doing this? How are they coming to their numbers? As you say, it is very difficult to um, validate any adjustment to the market at the current time because there is little in the way of fresh evidence. So um, we are continuing to value based on pre-March um, 11th evidence um, and no adjustments are being made for any um, potential um, upward or downward movement in the market. So every single report that um, yourself and your clients will receive will contain the RICS market uncertainty clause um, and where required or if appropriate, where 180 day sales periods or 90 day sale periods are provided, a further clause will be provided just to cover off that element of the, uh, the report. We will obviously be guided what the RICS um, advise us over the coming weeks and months um, I think there's a, an updated uncertainty clause coming out in the coming weeks for uh, certain types of commercial assets. Um, but until that time, uh, we will continue to value on that pre-March the 11th date, um, and that may be uh, in place for some time, I should imagine, until we start seeing new evidence coming to the market on residential commercial assets, uh, residential investments, etc. And the um, RICS uncertainty clause, would you mind just explaining that a little bit, just because I'm not sure that necessarily everyone would have come across that before? Yeah, so it's, um, it's basically stating that we are valuing um, prior to the, um, to the um, pre-March 11th date. It's making sure that everyone is aware that um, it's in the uncertain time of COVID, which is on the, an unprecedented pandemic. Um, and it's just to obviously give that clarity for the lender. We are valuing at that date. And so it's the lender's responsibility 
to potentially restrict or reduce LTVs or look at income cover ratios um, to mitigate any potential risk if there is a downturn or, or adjustment in values. I see that makes good sense. Thank you. And when um, our um, clients come to us and they're looking to do a mortgage and they're saying, well, I don't really know what value to put on my property at the moment. You know, I'm looking on Zoopla and it's telling me that it's, you know, this value. Is there any advice you can give to people in terms of how they should come up with their starting figure? I think um, it's always helpful if there's a previous purchase um, and a date provided of that purchase, if that's available in, in recent years, or um, from remortgage value, um, if that can be provided. So if you've had a remortgage five years ago or two years ago, those sorts of figures are um, also very helpful. Um, we appreciate it's very difficult, but as much information that can be provided at the time of instruction um, alongside that estimated values, so whether that be ASTs, licensing, schedules of works, if uh, um, upgrades have been made to the property, um, just to give the value of all of the background, um, which A, allows them to provide a most accurate assessment, but also prevents post-valuation queries after the report has been submitted. Sure. Thank you. Okay, cool. And my last question for today. Um, do you think that going forward there'll be any changes to the valuation process now that lenders have become more um, open to desktop valuations? I think desktops um, and AVMs to an extent have been very beneficial just to keep the markets moving um, during the lockdown period. Um, albeit it's been mainly on the true residential and single buy to let assets. Yeah. Um, all lenders that we act for within Allied have reverted back to full property inspections now uh, since those restrictions were eased on the 18th of May uh, for a few reasons uh, depending on which lender. So I think a number of lenders out there wish to uh, securitize and so there are mandatory requirements for many that um, internal inspections are required um, and so desktops just could not take place for for those clients during the lockdown period. Those that are um, offering or were offering desktops were typically um, taking a, a slightly um, lower level of LTV offering on those loans um, and so they couldn't be geared quite as high as they might normally would be, potentially. And from a risk perspective, a value on a desktop is having to value on a lot of um, assumptions. And clearly, if a value is able to go out to a property, even if it's potentially um, just on an external visit, if an internal inspection cannot be carried out, so a drive past, for example, at least they're able to then analyse structural defects that might be at the property or Japanese knotweed at the property or those sorts of concerns which are obviously fundamental to the value uh, that the lender needs to know about. Um, so there are a, um, a few hurdles which I think prevent lenders fully going down that route um, from our own client perspective anyway. I think also the, the cost element has to be considered in, um, in that particular service. Although there is a potential time saving and a travel cost saving um, from a desktop being processed, the amount of additional time required by a valuer to get the details of that property because he hasn't seen it um, visually, um, I think that's outweighed by the actual time um, which may be spent actually going to visit. So I think there is a balance. Um, and they probably have their uses in some instance, potentially in Wales at the moment, for example, where we cannot continue inspecting at the current time. Um, but I think um, now that we can inspect again, that is the, the main focus for our own clients. Yeah, and I think it's no coincidence that the value is being able to go back out and physical inspections taking place has also seen a number of lenders um, increase their loan to values because they simply need the physical inspections to you know, maintain their appetite and manage their risk. Um, yeah, well, it was, it was helpful during the period, and so we were able to do desktops on, on a, a variety of properties, and even on some of the uh, more complex assets, like your, um, your HMOs, 
um, we were able to do a desktop assessment, but then prior to loan completion, we were actually, um, once we were allowed to go and inspect those properties, just to give it a final sign off and validate the earlier desktop, which allowed underwriting to take place, allowed the legal process to get underway, um, rather than just having everything held back until those structural inspections were, were permitted. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, it's been um, really good for us actually just to sort of see how agile a fairly sort of static industry can become when it needed to. So it's been really refreshing actually. Absolutely, yeah. So I think a huge amount has been um, processed during the lockdown period, which is very pleasing. Technology has proved it works remotely for everyone. Um, and I think it will be a, obviously a changed world um, over the coming months and probably moving into next year potentially. Yeah. Um, It'll be interested to see how the market um, reacts over the coming months. Indeed. Simon, that's all of our questions for today. So um, thank you so much for joining us. Really appreciate you taking the time. My, my pleasure. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Now, last, but by no means least, is our final guest today. This is Julian Sampson, who is partner, head of lending at TWM Solicitors. Now, TWM was established in 1799 and is a leading South East law firm with over 220 staff um, based across Surrey and London. Now, TWM are a full service firm undertaking all um, aspects of the spectrum of legal work. Um, our experience of TWM has obviously come from the property side and we have found their knowledge and service to be impeccable. Now, the logic for inviting a solicitor um, along to our event today, and we're incredibly fortunate because Julian is a really busy guy, um, he's been able to join us, is really um, linked to, again, questions that people have been asking us um, during lockdown. So, for example, um, are the solicitors even working? Can you complete on a mortgage at the moment? Um, you know, it's a very paper heavy industry. Um, how are they able to work around things? We thought it'd be really useful to bring along someone who is obviously very experienced um, from the legal field to update us on where things are and give us some thoughts for the future. So we're delighted to welcome Julian Sampson. Julian, thank you so much for joining us today. We really appreciate you taking time out of your very busy day to talk to us. Um, and I guess the first question I wanted to ask you is um, what main challenges solicitors have faced during lockdown? Well, thanks, Janet. I mean, it's a pleasure to be here and to sort of share what we're, we're going through at the moment. But um, I think we experience very similar issues to, to anybody else that's office based, to be honest. There's nothing that makes us exceptional. Um, there, are, there are a couple of very strange things that we do do that, that, that are impacted by being in lockdown. I mean, first and foremost, of course, and my ability to improve dramatically during lockdown. So that's the challenge is keeping the weight down more than anything. But again, that's very similar to everybody else. I think communication remains um, remains the biggest problem. We as a team are very chatty. Um, so, and it's important when we're progressing transactions for our lender or investor clients that we, we chat with each other, everyone knows and works on files together. We lose that. So it's about, we've had to try and work out how to um, maintain that sort of high level of, of, of uh, interaction, but doing it virtually. And, you know, we've been through all manner of different um, uh, uh, outlets for that, whether it's WhatsApp, whether it's Teams. Um, nothing quite beats being on the end of a, a of a sort of a, a, a chat with somebody um, across across the office. So that has been a challenge. Um, we've obviously tried to be more paperless than ever, but it's a paper heavy industry we're in generally. So the land registry, for example, will not accept a mortgage deed that is electronically signed. The law doesn't allow for that at this stage, although the law commission have been looking into it. So. There is this counterbalance between the desire to go paperless and the law preventing you from doing so. So you've had to sort of muck around a wee bit and accept that there's never a perfect solution on this. Um, so that's been a, a challenge, along with some of the external influences. So uh, money laundering and fraud has been the potential for that has increased. We've had to be more aware of that. Um, Cybercrime, as affects every business, crime service specifically, has increased. So we've had, I think, three attacks already this morning, for example, that our IT has been able to rebuff. 
Right. That's forever going ahead and more so in lockdown. Um, as far as uh, other external influences, we've noticed our lender clients, their customer services angles have changed slightly, um, improving a lot in the loss of latter stages. But in the first three, four weeks, obviously, they're implementing business continuity plans. They're moving a lot of their staff from the underwriting sections into customer services to deal with mortgage holidays. That then has a, another impact on how we progress because we are part of a bigger picture. Yeah. And so we can do as much as we can, but we are stuck with slowest week, the weakest links in pain, and those chains are diverted elsewhere. And then I think for us, the biggest challenge has been how other solicitors have dealt with, um, dealt with, the, the, with the lockdown. Um, a lot of firms, and thankfully we're not one of them that has been impacted on this internally, but a lot of firms have obviously put the earners on furlough scheme right. um, or have cut down their, their, their days in the office, say, by 20%. So that means you may be dealing with a solicitor on the other side who, um, who has no idea about the file they're running because the person typically running it has been furloughed. So we have to drag them, I think, to a position where they understand the file, understand the transaction, and understand what the, the outcome needs to be. I think that's been, that's been challenging, um, as well as obviously the general impact on business all round. So we've, there's been a, you know, a couple of large national law firms. Um, one has gone into administration a couple of weeks ago. There are plenty of, talk of others that are running out of cash in spite of the, the, the business bounce back load. So, um, it's, it's a movable feast, plenty of challenges out there, but you know, nothing that's not reconcilable, I think. Okay, yeah. I think it's been a, a huge challenge for all businesses. I don't think there's a, an industry this hasn't touched in some way, shape or form, for sure. And we've all had to kind of amend our working ways. Um, so in terms of the processes, and I know that a lot of the um, work that's involved in conveyancing is quite process heavy, has there been any changes that you guys have been able to implement to kind of combat any blockages caused by lockdown? Yeah, I think uh, as far as the process is concerned, again, you are as, you're as good as your, your, your weakest link, as I've sort of said. So if you've got a solicitor on the other side or acting for the borrower um, and they are not as digitally advanced as you are, then you can push so far, but at some point you have to retract a bit and run alongside them. Um, but we are, I mean, certainly as far as our internal process is concerned, we've um, worked a little bit closer as hunting groups. So we are able sort of a, a, as a pair or as a trio to attack files in various ways. And that might be being up another solicitor or really sort of time to provide some um, online support for our investor or borrower clients. So you know, how can they transfer or transmit documentation to us in a, in a secure environment? And we'll, we'll have data rooms and facilities able to do that. Um, we have, um, we were quite lucky because there are a number of improvements we were making to our process that we um, were, were soft launching through January and February. So actually the lockdown almost became quite timely insofar as we were able to really push that out an environment that had work so we developed um, online onboarding for our borrower clients so there is no no need for them to use paper anymore um, obviously electronic id is moving very fast at the moment both with facial recognition um, and with open banking and then where we act for the lender only um, and borrowers have their own system we also have an online um, delivery system and questionnaire that, that they can work with so again they don't have to duplicate the paper process that they can upload directly to us in, in what they're asking. But that's been quite useful for us. Then generally, we, we, we're quite lucky. One of our team members um, has experience in electronic bundling for court. So what she's been able to do is work with us in developing document management systems and label us to bundle documents together for delivery to either the borrower or the lender or even internally that self-paginate that um, self-index wow. so those sort of things just basically make some of our internal digitization a lot lot simpler and I think it's been quite quite a revelation for us as well in relation to how we then use tech going forward because we've been quite um, keen on developing understanding of digital mortgages um, working with the land registry University of Surrey to look at how that might look over the next five to ten years and that's going to brought forward a lot of that research and thinking on our side 
it may not be ready for the market yet, but it is something that you know we want to be at the front of, both in relation to technical process and also the ethics of it. Um, so I think that's going to be um, that's been a the, the lockdown has enabled us to bring forward a lot of this stuff. Yeah, I think. Um yeah, a lot of um, industries which historically have been classed as not very techy, it's been really fantastic actually to witness how when pushed they are able to bring in some solutions that actually do help to um, move things along and streamline things. So it sounds like the changes that you guys are making are actually really positive um, and I'm guessing that these would remain a permanent feature going forward so maybe set out a path for a new kind of way of working for you guys rather than reverting back to the previous um, methods? Yeah, I hope so. I mean, we're, we're, we're really excited about the way it was moving anyway. So the ability to, to push it into what we're doing, to have lenders turn around and investors turn around and say, oh, you know what, we're buying into this with you. Because for a lot of people as well, they were resting about what's out there with a lot of different, you know, take open banking example. People aren't still wholly confident with it. But, but when, a, when a solicitor backs it, provides it as part of a broader process, I think that gives them a layer of comfort that they didn't otherwise have. But certainly we're trying to sort of edge our clients towards that as a more permanent fix from what we're trying to do. Um, and, and more importantly, I think once, as lockdown hopefully eases shortly, we are going to be in a really good position, I think, to push ahead and support the market as it grows. Because I think we are probably about, a, a, you know, at the in the lead of what we're trying to achieve so we won't have to catch up um, as we think other firms may have to i think as far as permanence is concerned however there are some things that will revert so um, i mean the specialist market is is quite innovative anyway so that's positive but you know we will still require bizarrely in fact um, there are still issues in relation to as i say mortgage fraud banking fraud, interception of banking details, and people don't trust email encrypted or otherwise. So there is a, a general theme, for example, of faxing bank details across. Right. Because bizarrely, it's old tech, but it is bizarrely more secure for interception like that. Um, as I say, deeds still need to be in paper format, and, and you know there needs to be legislative change for that change uh, uh, in the way to move forward. So that will revert to type. And, you know, we are still a, the legal sector and the conveyance sector specifically is still quite big um, as far as the number of firms out there. And so you can have digital leaders and you can have people who have improved processes, but, you know, Mr. and Mr. Smith may still wish to instruct um, a local law firm who are not as progressive. And that's fine, but we then have to make sure that we run alongside that rather than counter what's what they're trying to achieve. Um, and so there, there will be some some regression, but hopefully you know, there will be some permanence in what we're trying to achieve as well. I always find it quite fascinating, actually, how many people want to instruct a solicitor who is local to them. Um, for some reason, and they're quite happy to with the mortgage broker that they're never going to meet, but they'd like the solicitor to be nearby. And I don't know if it's that kind of perception that the technology isn't there, and so it would be an issue to not deal with a local firm. So it's good to see you guys are pioneering change and I guess on the subject of processing I mean is the conveyancing process protracted because of lockdown is it taking longer um I'd like to say um I'd like to say no and I think that's 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 what I'm generally thinking I mean there have been some small um hurdles for us to overcome logistically not least as I say delivery of documentation or working out how clients can provide suitable ID in, in a format that's, that's acceptable to, to either borrower solicitors or to or to lenders. Um, I think one of the biggest publicised within the sector was the was drafting and negotiating what they call COVID clauses in contracts. Right. So that might be where um, you have a certain purchase going through, but the um, during the course of um, the process or pre-completion particularly um, the, the owner of that property was unable to leave because they suddenly developed the virus um, and therefore couldn't vacate the property completion because they might be shielding and self-isolating. So there was probably two or three weeks where a number of COVID clauses for contracts were flying around. Um, and as with all things with lawyers, we took 
an arm, an absolute age trying to negotiate the minutiae of each of these clauses without actually looking at the broader picture of the transaction. So, you know, it was it was fascinating seeing everyone sort of worrying about where the comma goes, <laughs> but it didn't really help the transaction broadly. Um, so, you know, that that but that's for a time. That's for a moment in time, and that, that that has eased, and people have worked out more more simple ways of of, of getting around it. Um, lender focuses, um, as I say, have been elsewhere at the early stages of lockdown. So, and not least, obviously, valuations haven't been able to, to be undertaken for a number of weeks. So, you know, those have all impacted general timelines concerned. But we, as an office-based environment, um, Aside from one or two tech glitches, I guess, in relation to, 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 to communication, um, our processes have been okay and have, have really suffered any substantial time hurdles. Broadly, if you bring in all the other pieces, there have been some delays in transactions and transactions falling away, but I think that will recover really, really quickly, if not already. Good, thank you. And on the subject of lenders, have you seen any changes in terms of their requirements? So, um, for example, are they asking you for any more bits of paper than normal? Yeah, I, I mean, they are, um, and understandably, I guess. I mean, they, they've had to, as finances of the country has changed and the finances of individuals have changed, um, lenders have had to be more aware of, of that dramatic impact on affordability. Um, and and that of the underlying properties they're trying to um, they're trying to, to to mortgage. So we've seen um, changes by way of pre-completion calls. So lenders calling borrowers a lot more frequently than they used to. That's a tain of things have changed. We've had solvency declarations from borrowers to say that they aren't going under uh, or don't believe they are. And we've had some some issue uh, mortgage holiday statements. So asking a borrower to say, look, we are not aware of A, having asked for a mortgage holiday or any intention for a mortgage holiday in the, in the forthcoming months. Obviously, it's crystal ball time, but we have seen lenders act on that because we currently had one portfolio client who'd taken eight mortgage holidays about to complete on a case. The lender found out about the previous eight mortgage holidays and the offer was so you know we are we have seen that impact few fewer than 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 than, I, than probably people would have expected but it is there and is something that people are just their broker about. Um, but as far as we're concerned and the documentation that we're doing, there are some what I would loosely call pandemic patches things that we've put into place that won't last beyond lockdown. So within the first week we um, uh, drafted COVID clauses, uh, sorry, COVID agreements for our lender clients in relation to the delivery of distant uh, legal advice, particularly for personal guarantee, because, you know, we will often send a guarantor or offer independent legal advice. They would usually do that face to face in the presence of the solicitor, but they can't obviously do so um, if, um, if they're in lockdown. So we work with lenders to, to find ways to mitigate that problem. It's been adopted across the industry, which we're delighted with. Um, lenders are accepting search insurance now. Um, they're accepting scans over original documents. So all these sort of things are have, have actually mitigated the other points that we've discussed about sort of more clarity for borrowers. Um, as far as the law is concerned, you know, our instructions haven't changed. They are still the way they are. So we're quite lucky that things haven't changed. Good. Okay, thank you. And my last question or request for you today, Julian, is um, if you could offer up three tips to ensure a quick completion. Right. Well, that is 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 the is the, is the, the, the hundred million dollar question. Isn't it? <laughs> so if you could do it, that'd be great because I could be in for some money. Here. <laughs> well, but the three tips I would probably give um, would be the same I would give you this time next year, Jen. I think that's really important. So, because what we what we're doing in, in lockdown is, is is an unusual situation. It is it is, in many respects, not the new normal. Um, so, the the key for everything, as far as we're concerned, in quick completions is communication. Don't assume that your lawyer knows what you've discussed with your broker or accountant or lender, because we aren't your broker, accountant, or lender, um, and that information doesn't always come through to us. Um, work with us, don't work 
to beat us. You know, there may be things that you would rather not tell us or think ever not to tell us, but tell us because we are, you are our clients and we're there to, to act in your best interest. So the first and foremost is communication. Don't assume that we know what, what we want to achieve unless you actually tell us. What we want to achieve. Um, second point is answer every question. So if we ask you something, it's for a reason. So um, you may want to skip it or come back to it later, but please don't skip over it permanently because we will have we have very direct questions that we ask that are specific to you and your transaction. They're not just generic questions we like to just push out to everybody for fun. Um, they will be specific. So, so answer it as best you can or say you can't, and that's similarly a good answer. And lastly, um, one that's a real bugbear of mine at the moment is deal with your low-hanging fruit. So when your offer comes out, you will, for example, have a direct debit mandate, or you will have to sign the offer. So all these things are things that you can do internally. Just get it done. The number of completions that dates that we get to where we've satisfied everything, the broker satisfied everything, the value has satisfied everything, money isn't released because the client hasn't returned a form is incredible. It drives us all mad. Um, and then the client is running around thinking, why on earth hasn't everyone pulled this together sooner? But at some point, the client and borrower has to take responsibility for that. So really, really simple exercise. Deal with your low-hanging fruit. And I can see why the last one would be a particular bugbear as well. It has Julian, <laughs> thank you so much for taking the time to um, join me today. And also for your patience, I know you've seen the door moving where the dog's coming in and out and you've kept a straight face. So thank you Just very about. much for your professionalism. <laughs> um, <laughs> really well. Thanks a lot. Cheers, Julian. All right, Jen. Thanks. So thank you again to all of our guests for joining us today. Um, we really hope that you found that helpful. I know I've thoroughly enjoyed hearing everything they have to say. And now moving on to the final section of our event for today, and that's the questions that you have kindly sent in in advance of, of the event. Now, we're simply not going to get time to answer all of them because there were so many. Um, so what we'll be doing is... Um, addressing some of the ones we won't get to today um, in our weekly update newsletter next week. Um, so if you aren't signed up for the newsletter, please do sign up and then you'll um, find further um, quick Q&As from us going forwards. So the first question that we've been asked, and we've had several of these, is linked to payment holidays and whether they will impact the um, borrower's ability to obtain a mortgage going forwards. Um, so yeah, I think, I mean, I covered this with Vanessa earlier on, um, but it's fair to say that um, lenders are asking questions with regards to payment holidays. Um, there are also, um, as Julian referred to, some due diligence that's happening as part of the legal work as well. And essentially, lenders fall into one of three camps. There are those lenders who say, um, do you know, we're fine about you taking a payment holiday, we understand it, and that's all, all no problem. The second approach is those lenders who are saying, absolutely, we will not lend to someone who is in the midst of a payment holiday who has taken one recently. And finally, there are those lenders who are saying, well, hang on a minute. If you are in a payment holiday at the moment, that implies that you are struggling to meet your obligations over here. So it would be fairly irresponsible of us to further indebt you on a separate mortgage unless you can really explain to us the situation. So lenders will then, in, who take that approach, will be asking for more information with regards to the applicant's finances. Um, there'll be questions around liquidity, um, various savings and so on and so forth. So if you are in the middle of a payment holiday, it's not um, by any stretch of the imagination that you won't be able to get a mortgage, but you are going to probably need some help to do so. So um, do give us a call. We'd be very happy to help you out with that. Another question we've been asked is that, um, have many properties been instructed for sale in recent weeks? I know we have had a pickup in activity, but people act, have people been actively looking to sell or move in significant numbers? And I think um, having looked at various data that's been released, and I would say at this moment in time, there is huge amounts of data swilling around. Um, but the general um, consensus is that there is a huge demand for property purchases at the moment. And there is new property coming onto the market um, also. 
However, um, right move were quoted last week, week as saying that there was um, they're missing 175,000 um, properties for sale to kind of meet up with demand. So, yes, I hope that helps answer that question. Um, another question we've been asked is whether we have a better idea of if the anticipated slump in the market, um, when it will start to materialise and will this just be in London or other parts of the country, such as the northwest etc and how long will it last um my personal view is that the um the market is going to hold steady for the next few months because there's a huge pent-up demand on the back of not just lockdown but also we had the run-up to brexit as well which kind of held things off so to give you the kind of potted history um brexit made lots of people put off making large financial decisions um we then had in um december the election there was the boris bounce in january everyone was really excited and looking to buy houses and feeling really confident and then we went into lockdown um, so there's still a huge amount of demand for people that hadn't satisfied that requirement in the one month that we had some kind of normality. And it's definite signs that people are looking to make good on those plans still. There is a concern going forward, as Vanessa has alluded to, that um, once the furlough um, schemes start to end, there'll be more redundancies um, across the UK. And that might then dumb things down in terms of activity in the market. I don't think that's going to be just limited to London by any means. I think that this is going to impact everybody. Um, certain parts of the country may be impacted more than others, but I think actually this will probably be more local than region. Um, so, for example, if you had an area where, as an example, the um, large amount of the employment in that area was linked to aviation, um, those areas may see a higher level of unemployment and that would impact their housing market more than an area which didn't have that exposure. In terms of how long we expect any kind of slump to last, um, again, it's a difficult question to answer. Some are predicting, predicting a um, sharp V-shaped um, recovery, some it's more of a U, um, and others, you know, it's even slower than that. My personal view, and this seems to be echoed by quite a lot of people in the industry at the moment, is that things are going to be um, very, very unsettled for the rest of this year. And then we'll start to see a real recovery um, going into 2021 with things people are saying back to normal by 2022, maybe earlier in 2021, depending how things land. So I hope that helps. Um, a question we've been asked, I want to know on a general note how the buy to let side of mortgages has altered. For example, what changes lenders are bringing into the market as a result of the pandemic? So at the start of lockdown, we saw a huge amount of change with lenders pulling rates, scaling back criteria, um, you know, and as I mentioned earlier, even pulling out of the market altogether. And what we have seen since is lenders coming back to the market and improving their criteria. A lot of this was actually linked to the um, value was not being able to go out. And as David and Adrian um, talked about earlier on, the way that the lenders are funded, um, some lenders simply need to have physical valuations on their um, files um, as part of their funding agreements. So they weren't able to continue. So look, where we are now is that the um, buy to debt mortgages are available at up to 80% loan to value. There's no 85% mortgages just now, but there are 80% deals. Admittedly, not many, but there are some there. Um, lenders are certainly um, asking more questions with regards to um, income stability, particularly for self-employed people, understandably. And also, um, as we've mentioned already, um, there is a curiosity with regards to um, whether the borrowers have been taking payment holidays and questions around that. But really beyond that, in terms of appetite to lend, I would say that lenders are still very much in the market to lend their money to you. Um, there's going to be some more nervousness, there's going to be more caution. But I'm struggling to think of a single deal or inquiry that's come across my desk that I have not been able to place that I would have been able to place pre-coronavirus. Like I said, the real notable change for me has been the um, loan to value restriction from 85 down to 80%. Another question we've been asked, is there an ideal level at which to leverage a property going forward to benefit from good rates, but also not feel the effect of the diminishing tax relief for buy-to-let investors? 
Um, which is a really great question. I'm not going to comment on the tax relief side of things because we're not accountants or tax advisors. But what I can tell you is that in terms of attracting the best interest rates, Lenders um, will stagger their pricing in like bands of loan to value. So you will find that generally speaking, the best pricing is available for mortgages at 60% loan to value and below. And then things tend to move upwards in blocks of 5%, so 65, 70, 75%, 80, um, with 80% being the most expensive way to borrow money. Um, and our last question that we're going to answer today, because I'm conscious of time, is over the last two weeks, the property market has been really busy. Both auction and on-market properties have been going over market prices. We see very similar situations in the stock market. How should we interpret the current market and what should we expect in six to 12 months time? Again, another great question. Um, yes, definitely the markets have got very busy and I think um, you need to treat this with an element of caution because as mentioned a few moments ago, there is a huge amount of pent up demand. And people are saying, not just myself, but across the industry, you know, there's a kind of bounce here in terms of people coming into the market, looking to make good on transactions they've been planning to make for not even months, but for years. Um, and actually, we still have a way to go with regards to coronavirus and the lockdown and the knock on impact on the economy going forwards. So I think realistically, um, the um, kind of initial bounce is to be taken with some caution. Um, I do think things will probably flatten out over the coming few months, um, but I do expect fully things to recover as well. And I think the biggest question mark we need to be asked is sitting over, um, not will it recover, but when it will recover. And as I mentioned a few moments ago, um, we expect this to be probably towards the back end of 2021. So that's it for the Q&A and that is it for our landlord event. Um, again, thank you so much for joining us. Um, we do really appreciate it and sincerely hope that you have found this useful. Um, in terms of um, follow-ups, if you have any questions from the event, you're very welcome to email us or give us a call. We have um, many mortgage brokers um, who are available to answer any questions that you have and be delighted to have a conversation with you. So feel free to pick up the phone. But yeah, that's it from us. So thank you again um, and have a lovely evening and hopefully we'll be speaking to you all at some point in the very near future. Look after yourselves. Mm -hmm.